Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Raiders BCA Restart Clinic on Good Practices on Project Restart Application. My name is Ken Wei from BCA, and I will be the host for the webinar session. We are happy to have Real Estate Developers Association of Singapore, Raiders, in joining us today to organize this webinar clinic. We hope that this clinic provides good understanding on Project Restart Application, the self-help tool, the do's and the don'ts when putting up the application so as to facilitate quicker approval. Before we start, please note that as participants, you are on mute settings. Should you have any questions about the discussion topics, you may do so by clicking the Q&A button on the screen to type in your queries. When we get to the Q&A session, at the end of this webinar, we will also be activating the raise hand function so as to take live questions from the audience. Should you wish to ask a question verbally at the time, do click the raise hand icon. Do also note that when the session ends, you will be directed to assess an evaluation form after you have exited the webinar. Once submitted, you will be able to download the speaker's presentation materials. We are pleased to have Mr. Chia Niang Hong, President of Raiders, and Mr. Ching Bi Biao, Ching Chi Biao, Committee, Com Committee Member of Raiders, to co chair the session today. Together with him, we have Engineer Long Hien Hao, Director, Bridges and Structural Steel Department, BCA. Mr. Jeremy Tan, Deputy Director, Debt Building, Plan and Advertisement Licensing Department, BCA. Engineer Dr. Chan, Deputy Director, Bridges and Structural Steel Department, BCA. Ms. Vivian Fu, Deputy Director, Strategy Engineering Projects Department, BCA. Mr. Ted Chan, Executive Direct Manager, Procurement Policies Department, BCA. And Mr. Abner Wee, Executive Manager, Green Building Policy Department, BCA, who will be sharing with us on a good practice guide on project restart applications for the developers. Without further ado, let us invite our webinar chairperson to deliver his welcome remarks. Mr. Chia, please. Thank you, Yen Wei. It's Long Hien Hao and the BCA colleagues, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. A warm welcome to the BCA Radars Clinic on Good Practices on Project Restart Application. We understand that the attendance is uh, very good today. I think probably BCA can tell you the number later on. And it goes to show the importance and relevance of this very timely clinic. At today's session, BCA will provide a detailed understanding on the project restart application process from self-assessment checklist to the do's and don'ts during the application. Undoubtedly, we would all know that construction is a very complex process involving many stakeholders as well as, as uh, many regulatory agencies where their consent are required at some point in time. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought along challenges of a very different dimension, causing disruptions and impacting project timelines as well as cash flow of many companies, especially the SMEs. Indeed, there is no historical precedence for the current in extensive impact on the industry. I think it's quite unprecedented. Even as the construction activities are allowed to resume for projects which are able to meet the COVID safe restart criteria, the process is quite painful and slow moving. The industry, including developers, contractors, subcontractors and supply chain vendors, etc., are experiencing varying degrees of problems and hurdles from uncertainty in labor supply and workers accommodation to application process and project timelines. We appreciate BCA is making significant effort to expedite a smoother and safer restart. Radars is pleased to partner BCA in this clinic to look at restart application process and how we can work together to ensure that it is safe and sustainable. We look forward to your active participation and to provide constructive feedback at the Q&A session. On this note, I would like to thank BCA again for the invitation and I wish everyone a fruitful session ahead and all the best as we journey together into a new normal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chia. Next, we'll have BCA to share with us on a good practice guide on project restart application for developers. Angeline and Jeremy, please. Hi, um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming down today. Um, so I'll be going through um, the project, 
the project application for construction projects and supply works, as well as landed housing projects, and um, highlighting the main areas where a lot of applications have gotten rejected on, and what um, the main contractors can do better to make sure that the application process goes very smoothly for everyone. Okay. Yeah, so I'll go through, I'll go through the um, whole uh, project flow chart of the whole application process and also highlighting um, this self-assessment checklist that BCA has um, come up with to help um, the industry self-assess whether their projects are ready to meet the three COVID safe restart criteria before actually submitting their applications. And yeah, and basically um, the whole application process. So for um, this presentation today, um, we'll only be looking at the um, application process for construction projects and supply works as well as landed properties. And um, for these two types of um, projects, um, you will need to satisfy all three of our COVID safe uh, restart criteria. So that includes the COVID safe work site, the accommodation and transport, as well as the COVID safe work criteria. Okay, so this is an infographic that is available. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the infographic um, that is available available on our BCA website, and it basically goes through um, all the there are links there on all the different um, criteria documents, and you can um, look through it properly. And um, just to take note for. Um, DLP works and projects under CSC and TOP, um, the application process will have to go through this um, BCA renovation and construction accounts application and does not follow what we are covering here today. Okay, so today is only for construction projects and supply works as well as landed housing projects. Okay, so now this um, self-assessment checklist is basically um, a checklist tool that you can fill in to make sure, and it highlights all the critical criteria in our COVID safe restart criteria that you will have to um, adhere to. And so it basically helps you assess whether your company and your project site is ready for restart. Okay, so this, this will help you make sure that you do not get so many rejections um, in the event that you do not satisfy some of our, some of the COVID safe restart criteria. So, yeah. so an example of um, what the self-assessment checklist has, um, so it'll cover all the, the critical criteria for the COVID safe worker accommodation and transport, as well as, for example, in the COVID safe workforce criteria, making sure that um, your workers have all downloaded trees together and the, the SG work pass app. And for the COVID safe worksite criteria, um, making sure things like um, having appointed the correct number of SMOs and SDOs on site and making sure that um, not too many activities are carried out on site at any one time. And if more than one activity is carried out, um, proper segregation of the teams are implemented together with um, zone segregation to prevent interaction between the different teams. Okay, so now on to the actual application process. Um, this is um, the form, how the form SG looks like, the website. And um, in this application process, there will be six documents that will have to be uploaded. And I will go through um, each of these documents in detail. The first one is the main submission. The second one is a self-declaration form, basically stating that um, you have complied with the COVID safe restart criteria. And then the worksite safety Excel submission. So this includes things like your project schedule, um, the team segregation of your employees, and then the worksite safety plan submission are for you to upload um, images of, let's say, um, your zone segregation, etc. And then um, the last two are things like um, making sure that you have updated all the employee records with MOM. So this is on the OFWAS link. And then also a joint declaration form with the, build, uh, with the developer as well. 
So um, in the main submission, um, basically some of the things um, to take note of is to select the correct submission type. So if you are submitting for a public project to select a GPE and for private projects developer. And one of the other things also is the, to declare the correct project value. So some of the applications have gotten uh, rejected because the wrong project value has been quoted. Um, so you have to um, quote the project value that has been stated on your permit application. Okay, and then on to the main submission um, form, the Excel sheet. Um, the first thing that you would have to declare in this main submission are the project details. So um, what has happened is that one of the common mistakes is that um, the project reference number for your projects are um, tacked out wrongly. So sometimes you, um, there are hyphens that are missed out or certain uh, digits that are missed out. And also um, some people um, type in their ST or BP numbers. So um, how this works is that we need the actual correct format of the project reference number. So this does not include your ST or BP numbers, etc. Okay, and then the next um, other things also like um, inputting the correct format of the data specified in the Excel sheet. Okay, and also um, things like um, for your address or project titles, we understand it's very long. And what happens is that some people split up um, the address and the project title into separate rows, but you're just supposed to input it into uh, within just within one cell, one Excel cell. Okay, and other things that you would have to um, submit in your main submission are things like your um, firm details and your employee details. So just to take note for your form details, you have the main, since the main con is making the submission, the main con will also have to include all the information of all subcontractors um, and even uh, part-time visitors to the project site. So um, basically everyone who they can foresee will be entering the site. Okay. And for um, under employee details, also making sure there are no typos and giving the um, correct format of the NRIC and FIN numbers of the employees. And um, there's also an option here to select uh, whether um, th this employee will be full will be look, um, located at a project site full-time or part-time. So um, part-time would include things like your, um, your QP suit who will only visit the site every week or so. Okay, so the reason for this is because um, for full-time workers, they are only allowed on one site. Okay, so the next part is this um, Safe Restart Declaration Excel. So um, just to take note that this is under revision at the moment, and um, this will be taken out of the um, form soon. But just to take note of some of the points that um, have been getting the applications rejected on, are uh, things like, um, okay, so yeah, basically um, on the worksite requirements, things like the uh, main con not providing a system on top of um, safe entry NRIC. So in our worksite safety requirements, um, the builder is supposed to have an, an additional system on top of safe entry NRIC to track of all personnel who are entering and leaving the site. And so this can include like um, some uh, main cons already have their own visitor management systems or if you're a smaller site you can use just physical logbooks and the reason for this is because the information that is collected by safe entry NRIC is not available to the public and um, even and even to us so we will not have access to see who has visited the site and whether the people and the people entering the site are allowed to go onto site so you would need to have a separate system to keep track track of all these personnel Okay, and one of the other things also that we noticed is that um, some of the main con um, declared that um, they are not using the safe entry NRIC system. And to clarify on this, um, the safe entry NRIC system is required at the main site entrance and exit. And, we, and this is because um, only the safe entry NRIC version is uh, compatible with access code. So the access code um, is basically shows whether your the code of your worker is green, gray, or red. So on whether they, they are allowed to enter the site or not. So 
um, you are allowed to use safe entry QR for within the site, but not at the main site entrance and exit. Okay, and other, also other things like um, the main con will still have to provide um, individually packed meals for all workers. And for sick bays, um, there's only an exception for smaller sites where you do not need to provide any sick bay. But other than that, you would have to um, make this provision. Okay, so now on to the um, worksite Excel submission. Um, some of the things here that cause the application to be rejected is when um, this worksite, so this worksite detail that you're supposed to provide is supposed to be basically your project schedule and the activities that you'll be carrying out um, at least for the first three months when you start work. And uh, some of the applications were not detailed enough. So for ex an example here is that um, for ERSS works, one of the applications just stated ERSS, but um, you would have to um, break down the activity as detailed as you can. So an example here would be first installing sheet piles, then followed by exc excavation and your strutting installation. Okay, and then um, also uh, things to when making your application, you would have to look at your whole project in a very holistic manner. So don't just look at this as filling in the Excel as it is and then filling in the um, worksite plan as it is, but it has to all tie in together very nicely. And, and what I mean by that is that, for example, over here, um, if there is no zone zoning on site or if your site is very small and you are only allowed to carry out one activity at any one time, then these um, the start dates and end dates will have to correspond accordingly, so you cannot have any overlaps. But if you want to conduct um, more than one activity at any one time, then in your worksite safety plan submission, so the PowerPoint submission, you will have to provide very, uh, very clear zoning and demarcation plans. Okay, and um, just to take note here, um, the week zero over here when we put week zero is when, is, uh, when you foresee basically the moment when you start um, your works. Okay, and you will have to provide the proper staggering of workers if you are conducting one activity. Okay, so an example here um, shows um, how the segregation plan ties in together with the um, project schedule that I showed before. So um, in this example here, this worksite is um, only conducting, conducting one activity at any one time and they very clearly show um, where the works are conducted and what sort of activities being conducted and for how long. Okay. So the next part is also um, that you have to submit in your um, worksite Excel submission is the safe entry setup. So one thing to take note of is that you have to set up safe entry before you make your application. So one of the uh, mistakes that were commonly made is that the branch code over here was not provided. So basically, um, safe entry wasn't registered before they actually make the application. But um, yeah, but you would have to do it before you actually submit to us and you would have to give us your branch code information, which you would obtain after you set up safe entry. Okay. So yeah, this is the access code that I mentioned previously um, on um, who's allowed on site and who's not. So if you want more information on what um, the different colors of the access code mean, you can visit um, our FAQ section on our BC website. Okay. So other things also in our um, worksite Excel submission um, are things like sometimes insufficient SMOs and SDOs are appointed. So you can just refer to our COVID safe worksite requirements on how many are required for the number of workers on site. And then for the um, segregated team plan as well, um, basically all the employees who are provided in the main submission will have to be accounted for in this segregated team plan Excel. So um, what we've noticed um, occasionally is that some of the workers in the employee details main submission are not um, accounted for here and they are not assigned a team. So that's one thing you have to take note of. Okay, so now moving on to the um, worksite safety plan submission, which is the PowerPoint submission. 
Um, the items that you would have to display in your plan submission are things like your zoning and demarcation plans, your movement control plans. So basically, this is if you have different um, subcons working on site and a lot of different activities going on. You have to make sure that um, you have different access routes for the different teams to prevent any um, interaction between the different teams. And also um, illustrating um, all the hand sanitization points um, in the project site and also um, uh, illustrating your evacuation plan and your follow-up plan for any suspected and confirmed cases on site. Okay. So an example of how the zoning and demarcation plan would look like would be something like this, where you would have to um, state um, the type of activity conducted in each zone, the number of workers in each zone, and the color code of each zone. Okay. And um, the distance between each zone will also have to be at least two meters apart. Okay, so um, an example of how um, the, each team is um, assigned a different identifier. It could be the, by the colors of the helmet or the colors of their harnesses. Yes. So uh, this is an example also of, uh, movement con of the movement control plan. So as I mentioned previously, um, you would have to have different access routes for the different teams. And within, a shed, within any shared facility, so for example, like your canteens, um, if, the, if there are not enough sh um, canteens, for example, to um, stagger, the, uh, stagger the timings of when they are used, and, there will be, and if there will be multiple teams um, using the same facilities at any one point in time, the distance between um, people or the workers in the different teams will have to be, again, kept at least two meters apart. Okay, so this is an example, um, one of the good examples that we have from one of the applications. It shows very clearly the different zones and the type of works that are carried out and also um, the different access points for the different zones. Okay. So the other thing also is um, highlighting all the hand wash and sanitization points provided um, on site. And as a good rule of thumb, there should at least be one hand wash or sanitization point within each zone. Okay. So um, this is an example of what an evacuation plan would look like. So basically, um, your, um, your process flow of um, what is going to happen on site and what the SMO and SEO is going to do when they, uh, when they have a suspected case. Okay. And the same also for follow-up. Um, their follow-up plan um, after having uh, MOH contact them that, that it has been a confirmed case on site. So this is all available on our BCA website and can um, take a look at one of these examples. Okay. And then the next thing here, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that um, you would have to update the address and contact numbers of all your workers on um, MOM's um, OFWAS link. Okay. And then once you receive that email confirmation, then you just upload it and so that we know that um, all the information provided has been updated. Okay, and then the last thing that you would have to attach to our to your submission is this um, joint declaration form. Um, so basically, it um, is for the to show us that the developer is aware that um, of this application and that they are making this application together with the main con. Okay, and yeah, and and then another thing to note is that we are, we have gotten feedback that yes. Um, each document is only has a one MB limit on our main form submission. But um, if your submission file is too big, there are two ways to do it. One is that you can either, um, you'll be contacted by our processing officers to um, send them like a Dropbox link or um, send them the documents through via email if it's too big to upload. But if your submissions are still under seven MB, you can use this link here to upload any supporting documents that you may have. 
Okay, so basically if you cannot upload the file because it's too big, you can go through this link instead. Okay, but you must remember to um, quote your initial uh, form application reference number. Okay. So um, once your application has been approved, the process doesn't just stop there. You will still have to um, update BCA um, every three months on your work schedule. And the PM also has to still submit a daily report to BCA. So basically this daily report is um, to state whether there has been any confirmed case, if there's any suspected case on site, etc. Okay, so um, what if you've already gotten your approval and you realize that you want to change certain things in your application? So for example, if you need to make changes to um, the workers that you want to deploy on site, then you would have to go back to the same link and choose under submission type instead of previously you would have chosen either GPA or developer. This time around, you would choose a modification for a previously approved application and you would submit um, all your revised documents. So for example, if let's say previously you, um, you had gotten approval for 10 workers and now you want to submit an additional two workers to work on that project site, then you would have to submit again the whole list based of work to be working on your site. Okay, and if it's other things, smaller things like um, changes due to any typo errors in your project application, then you can email this um, email address here. Okay, so and if your application has been rejected, um, when you get the email um, of your rejection, uh, we will give you the reasons why your application was rejected. So uh, we'll suggest review those reasons and try and um, amend those accordingly. Okay, and, and then you can also use the self-assessment checklist to self-assess again whether your site is ready um, to meet the three COVID safety set criteria. Okay, so this is a summary of all the links you will require in the application. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. I'll pass it on now to my colleague who'll go through this um, audit and inspection. Okay, uh, hello, I'm Jeremy. Um, I'll be touching on the uh, in-house audit and inspection works. Um, what um, Angeline basically has uh, gone through with you just now is the series of uh, process and the procedures um, to actually uh, get your approvals. Once the approval has been obtained and um, the, start, the site is actually good to, uh, to go, uh, there will be a series of um, surveillance or maintenance of the um, approve, op, approved items that you need to do. And therefore, the importance of the uh, in-house audit and the inspection. So um, for you guys, I think uh, um, generally, I think it is important to, um, to make sure to, you can use your influence to ensure that the builders uh, will carry out all these um, all these uh, compliance uh, at site. Now, um, I only have a few uh, slides to share, but um, um, for this slide, I would like to actually mention about two important points. Uh, the first uh, being the importance of the safe management measures. And this um, basically is a series of planning that the uh, builder would actually would have to um, comply to. And in this uh, planning, um, there are a few things that they will have to do. Basically, uh, for instance, the segregation and zoning plans, uh, the cohorting plans. Uh, basically, this is to ensure that the, um, the proper segregation is being done. Um, should there be any uh, cases on site, uh, there will be um, we call it a suspected case evacuation plan or a COVID plus follow up plan. So these are the things that should, uh, should anything fails, uh, these are the, the business continuity plan that you need to have. Then uh, you also have um, some other things like uh, penalty system. Uh, this uh, may be something which is uh, only um, applicable on site um, to ensure that, for instance, if the um, workers, they are not wearing masks, uh, you may have a very simple penalty system to ensure that the uh, site personnel will actually comply to all these things. And of course, a series of monitoring plans for all this. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is that, that this is actually a series of plans that form the safe management measures. Now, um, to actually do up all these things, you need someone to implement this. And that comes to my second point, which is the importance of a, a site representative, which we call him a site management officer. 
So the site management officer SMO will actually play a crucial role to ensure that all these plans are actually being implemented and adhered to. So um, and and uh, and therefore with the planning as well as the personnel to actually implement this, this will actually be the 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 dual engine that will drive the uh, surveillance of the uh, compliance to the site. Okay, um, these are the three things to look out for. First being the safe access, the second safe distancing, and third containment. So for safe access, is essentially a control of the workers. So whether it is the workers or the site personnel working on site, these are the people that uh, uh, we have to ensure that the access for them is actually cleared. For safe distancing, um, uh, there will be a safe uh, SMO where she will be dealing with all these things segregation on site and, and to ensure their prepared needs and to turn on the Trace Together app. So basically these are things that uh, which also applicable to the community, but uh, this is applicable um, to what um, the, within the site has to actually do. Now, should everything fail, uh, there will be a containment that, uh, that needs to be done. In this case, um, a C plus response plan. So uh, this will actually uh, cordon off the affected zones uh, to isolate workers and to disinfect the sites before they inform the authorities. Now, um, BCA, we have actually done a series of audits since the restart process, and we have actually covered about 200 to 250 projects, uh, categorized into large and small projects. Uh, to share with you, these are some of the findings that we have. Uh, basically, uh, um, the, the top five, okay, the one that we have is actually, uh, as you can see here, the mismatch of the entry records with approved workers list and uh, the um, absence of the SMM measures because uh, probably in the beginning, the, the builders may not know how to plan for all these. Um, safe entry NRIC, not the QR code, that is not installed and used. Uh, this is basically a hardware problem. And uh, safe management officers not on site. Now, um, safe management officers, they, they need to be on site if there are works. Because in the beginning, I think there was actually concern that the SMOs are actually looking after a few sites. Okay, that is not so good. In fact, that is not uh, uh, good because um, when the work starts on this particular site, then we need the SMO to be on the particular site to actually ensure that all implement implementation are being done. And the last item is that uh, we find that um, for some sites, uh, the meals are not individually packed. Um, this is actually to prevent uh, the workers from cooking on site because the mode of transmission or infection uh, many times is due to sharing of food. Now, next, uh, I will actually share some pictures of what are the good examples of good practices. Um, like the first being the segregated entrances. These are all segregation. Uh, safe distance markings. Uh, clear zoning plan. And of course, some sites, they have uh, temperature monitoring and safe distance induction, uh, which is uh, conveyed to the site uh, workers on a daily basis. And of course, individually prepared meals. Uh, likewise, uh, there are actually some examples of not so good compliances, uh, which is cooking. As I mentioned just now, cooking is prohibited. And poor isolation facilities for sick workers and uh, we uh, require a um, site to provide an isolation bay uh, with good ventilation in the event that if someone falls sick and there is a place for him to rest before any follow-up actions are being taken. And the next one, uh, safe entry NRIC not used on site. Uh, this one, as I mentioned, this is actually control of the access of workers. So, um, of course, this is what BC has been doing uh, since the restart. And um, we actually have been inspecting and of course, we, uh, for some of these non-compliances, we will actually do some enforcement work um, ranging from giving a stern warning uh, to probably uh, issuing fines later if uh, things do not improve or in fact, uh, prosecution as, as well. So uh, basically, um, I think um, for, for you all, okay, uh, representing the um, project, you may want to actually convey this message down to the builders to the um, different value chains on the industry to ensure that uh, not only 
um, it's important to get the approval. It's also important to maintain and to uh, make sure that proper surveillance is being done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jer Angeli and Jeremy. Uh, right now, we'll move on to the Q&A sessions. You may raise your questions by clicking on the raise hand or the Q&A button on the screen. Before we start, um, perhaps what I'd like to start off is we maybe I'd like to ask some questions to uh, our webinar chair, Mr. Chia. Uh, hi, Mr. Chia uh, and Mr. Ching. Uh, would you like to give some advice on uh, what you'd like members to uh, know or how to approach a restart to ensure that it's safe and sustainable? And maybe you can also share your experience so far on the restart process and what are the learning points that you can actually uh, share with our members. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kenway. I start first, uh, then the CD can follow uh -huh. later. Huh? Okay, I think thank you for giving us a very detailed description of what is required of the application. So I would advise all uh, participants, our members, especially Redas members, to be very well prepared on the criteria and the requirements and don't leave things to chances. I think like this uh, Jason Chong and the uh, Lai also said that uh, whether a developer should go alone or build a my advice work very closely with your contractor. It's no point for you to submit and then later the builder not ready. So work very closely with your contractor and builders and work as a team. Then make the application going through all the requirements that is required for, of us. Uh, you, you, just like you heard, a uh, very detailed, even one dot, one comma can, can cause a rejection. So be very precise in your details to be submitted. And then, the, of course, our own staff and the contractor staff to be involved must be very uh, ready and uh, fully briefed and be familiar with the necessary uh, requirements and procedures. And uh, make sure that our site <laughs> is more or less quite ready to start work. You know, if the site is totally unprepared and then you send an application, the application come out, then uh, you are in a very uh, difficult situation. And uh, and more impo quite importantly is for the builders to make sure that they also take care of the accommodation when the approval is given and need to start with the tempor temporary accommodation to house the workers. If you need time to prepare the more permanent one on site, you may have to think of maybe at a hotel or some other temp temporary accommodation so that you can start work as soon as possible when the approval is given. And <coughs> not, not until you get the approval and start thinking of this, it's a bit too late to see. Yeah. And the um, important thing for the builders, especially uh, your builders, uh, the least developers builders, make sure they know where their workers are and which norm they are, which the dormitories they are, so that when the thing come out, they can straight away compile and then uh, compile the list of the workers and send to the necessary, uh, get BCA to help to get them out faster. Uh, I think so far BCA has been quite helpful uh, through the through the very active uh, what kind of intervention of the 2M, uh, been very helpful. Uh. So for those who got uh, gotten approval and then the workers still not sure where are they, they we would appeal through BCA to see whether they get some prioritized arrangement to get the workers under the approved list to come out as soon as possible. And of course, my advice to all my, my radars members and the builders is to follow all the safety and distancing rules very, very diligently. I think you saw in the forum forum page today about the uh, necess cannot be uh, take things for granted and uh, be too easy going because if it happened again, if the COVID happened again, it's going to set us back for a long, long time. And we can't afford this to happen in the construction industry. It's already a long period of stopping work and the contractor have been saying that uh, the cost of them is very, very high. So we cannot afford to have this relapse and then um, some of the site have to shut down again after restarting, which we can't afford to. Lah. So these are some of the important uh, things that uh, our members got to be careful. And uh, my advice, work very closely with the contractors and then submit as a team and be prepared for it, be prepared for it. And if there's, uh, there's hurdles along the way, fortunately BCA got a one-stop center to help us, to help us, uh, like I mentioned, that if the, your COVID came out, but you, you don't know where the workers are, submit your list of workers to the BCA who will help to more or less uh, talk to the joint task force to give some priority so that they can come clear them and come out uh, of the this uh, uh, this purpose built norm and and uh, uh, to then come out to the site where they are able to start work with the approved projects. Uh, CB, you want to uh, do the next one? The problems encountered so far? 
Okay, uh, I I just share with you from what I understand from a few contractors. Uh, as a developer, uh, we fully support a good practice as site, but uh, the problem the contractor facing is those practices may not be well coordinated among various agency, and uh, it get very confused. Uh, some agencies say this way, the other agencies say the other way. My view is the whatever good practices, it got to be practical and it got to be able to be implemented at the site. If it's not, uh, then the worker just cannot comply. Although you, you have so many uh, SMO, SDO, I'm just calculate uh, my job. You probably need 12 or 14 SMO, SDO full time at the job site because every 50 workers, you need one. <clears throat> so I think the process is can be very painful, but if we can make the process easier for the contractor, while we don't compromise on the safety, I think that will be the good achievement. Today, I look at it, so many paper of submission documentation to submit to, to get approval. Now, getting approval is now getting uh, to the way that BCA already got, got a few job sites, got approval, but then got approval, got no workers. The worker is a big problem, right? So if you want to release workers to the job site, we have to look at, all of us have to look at our manpower, whether BCA, the manpower sufficient, MOM, manpower sufficient, enable to release more workers with a green tag. And when a worker can go to the job site with a green tag, then your safe distancing, your control can come in place. I also have a feedback, feedback from a contractor saying that, okay, well enough, you want to have a different zone in the different, in the same project, want to have a different zone. But every, diff, every zone, you have a different group of workers. For instance, you have a, a, a carpenter, you got phone work, you got rebar, you got conduit m and &E, electrical. And the con condition given to them, I don't know whether right or wrong or true or not true. The condition given to them is when one group of, one group of worker in this zone finishes a job, you have to go away, five meters away. And then another group of workers, they say electrical come in to lay the conduit pipe. And then after that, then they're going to go away five meters far meter away and somebody some other group of worker come these are all within the same zone i'm i'm just curious if a contractor is correct then it's, it's going to be very not productive and not practical because <clears throat> you will delay a lot of work and these workers are all done through all the tests they supposed to have a green tag so so long as there is a sufficient uh, uh safe distance I think that should be enough. I think then the other problem is, you know, at the job site, there's a lot of changes. Today, I plan this activity from, from this date to another date. And then because of certain problem happen at the site, whether material delivery on time or what, I may have to change the date. So the form asks for the date of uh, each activity to be filled in and completion date to be filled in any changes, then you have to go back for approval. So I think unless all agency has sufficient manpower to handle all these small little details, otherwise I think it will be a delay. This is what the contractor have a great concern. You know, so of course contractor have many, many other concerns. The, the important thing is when they found that maybe this worker today not feeling well, he had to replace the workers because Short of one worker, the whole job site can stand still. Then they have to submit the name again. And uh, how soon can this approval be given? If it's not, that particular day or two days, the works have to stand still. So contractor is very, very concerned about all these things. So I hope uh, uh, the agency can consider this practical issue. And some contractor prefer to build the uh, so-called CT, uh, C, uh, LT, uh, what they call this, uh, the, the temporary uh, dormitory at the site. 
and uh, but temporary dorm dormitory at the site can only house they told me can only house 40 workers so they then they said look if my project is advanced stage if i want to build a worker dormitory at the site i have to do go to the basement fine you go to basement then you comply with ventilation requirement fsv requirement uh sprinkler requirement then you say look it's going to be very costly so i'm 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 just saying that yes all the agency put in a lot of effort which is good but at the same time can we find a practical way to do it without compromising the safety so that is my view as a developer because anything the contractor delay the job and i think they're going to delay and with all this control the job will delay for months and months and we developer will suffer uh, and financially we we will be in big trouble so that, that's my view yeah Hi. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chia. Thank you, Mr. Cheng, for your advice and some of your feedback from the contractors and from the ground. Uh, okay, I mean, I'd maybe to address some of your uh, issues I mentioned about these uh, workers having to uh, stay in groups within a particular zone of the site and moving on from one group to another, that's the productivity issues. Perhaps I can ask uh, Vivian to actually address on some of your site issues that was mentioned by Mr. Cheng. Hi, Vivian. No, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Ken Wei. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Cheng, Cheng uh, just like you mentioned about the uh, workers. Okay, so there are a few questions. Uh, one of them you mentioned is that uh, the productivity of the workers is reduced because of the uh, zoning and segregation. Uh, but uh, with this one is actually necessary in order to uh, to segregate the workers between different zones. So how uh, we try to reduce uh, the reduction in productivity is that if the workers need to work uh, within the zone, the same zone, uh, like uh, if you have, for example, I give an example, of, let's say you have 10 workers. So if you are working within that same zone and there are certain activities like, uh, like if, if when you are um, lifting rebars or if you are lifting certain things where it require more than one, in order not to reduce the productivity, actually we have written in the worksite uh, guidelines that the workers can come closer than the one meter to each other, but as far as possible, still observe the um, safe distancing measures. Uh. So in other words, they still have the mask in place and they make sure that they have good hand hygiene. So we're not saying that they cannot get closer to each other just because uh, they are doing certain works. Uh. So that is one of the ways in order not to reduce the productivity too much. Uh. But uh, we need to stress that it is important uh, for workers to still keep within their zone because this is the basis of how we try to uh, so-called we keep them within a bubble uh, so that if there is any infection right we are hoping that it's only uh, contained within that team so that if there's any works that uh, let's say if the workers need to be QO or if they need to be isolated it's just isolated uh. so maybe if you think of it in another way rather than having the whole work site stop right if you are just having a certain team of workers being stopped or uh, uh, only a group of workers being stopped that might be helping them in helping the work site yeah so that's no, one of the things yeah, Maybe yeah. I need, so uh i i agree that the different zone is important for the time being but once we in the same zone there are different group of workers different group of workers i mean vertical workers you have a steel bar workers you got form work workers they all come from different subcontractors but in the same zone so my my understanding is when this group of subcontractors doing one work, the other contractor had to move a five meter away so that there is a sufficient distance. So I'm talking like within the same zone. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if for this type of specialist uh, workers, right? Let's say for these are what we classify as those that will only go to site for a short period of time. So we know that there will be a certain decrease in productivity because of all these COVID-19 safe measures. Uh, but what the builder can do is that he can actually uh, he can actually plan his works better. So, which means that let's say if your electrical workers need to work in the same zone uh, at a particular period of time, they can do it at staggered timings uh, so, or even staggered floors. So, let's say if you are talking about like if it's a high-rise building, it can, they can be working on different floors 
at the same time. Uh. So that might be one of the way that no, you can... That, that is, I mean, that's for casting. Uh. Casting, you can't do it on different floor. And I oh, think if, the subcontractor yeah. for practical phone work and steel bar, they are almost full-time. Almost full-time for project, you know. Uh, okay, so uh, if they can be cohorted I, together, then they can yeah. actually be working together. So mm -hmm. if this can I just sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if the trades are related, uh, Vivian, possibly they could be cohorted as one team, right? Uh, because uh, you know one one activity easily leads to the other. That's one possibility. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's so right. that is one way. Yeah. So yeah. if they uh, can be cohorted together, then yeah. Then hey, thank you. Considered as one team, yeah. Okay. Thank, okay. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, Mr. Cheng. Uh, thanks, uh, Engineer thank Long. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, we can move on to other questions that have been asked by the attendees. Uh, I also received a lot of questions being asked about this uh, dorm clearances assess code. Uh, some also asking, uh, why is it the status of the workers? Their assess code has been changed on a daily basis. And uh, why is it that sometimes when they shift the workers around, uh, their assess code changed from green to red? So uh, maybe for these questions, I can actually pass it to Edna to uh, shed some light on this. Uh, Edna, please. Okay, uh, hi, uh, Edna from Safe Workforce Team. So just to give Edna some background, right, there's actually right, a team who is focused on assess code issues uh, in BCA. Uh. So um, um, there, we have already released a very detailed FAQs on um, why assess code is grey or red on our BCA homepage. But I'll just touch on a few um, common points. Uh. So if your access code is red, right, it could be due right, to um, these four common reasons. Um, first reason right, is that a lot of um, workers, they have not downloaded the TraceTogether app. And for those who downloaded it, they have not registered yet. Okay? Another reason could be um, they are staying in an unclear dormitory. Because if they stay in an unclear dormitory, their access code will definitely be a uh, default rate. And um, the last and um, most common reason uh, is that a lot of um, um, contractors, developers, right, they're not um, updating uh, the details of the workers. Uh, um, in, off, in OFWIAS, uh, which means that um, the current residency of the worker now is not what is reflected in M1's database. And this also can um, lead uh, to um, the access code being um, read. So um, if for, for more details, right, please refer to our website. Uh, we have released a full FAQ already and uh, the steps to take uh, to correct this issue. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perhaps to add on to Abner, uh, we also have this telegram that we have uh, that's uh, updated uh, information about uh, this uh, swabbing requirements and also the access code requirements. So uh, I will actually strongly encourage uh, attendees to actually uh, this uh, sign subscribe to the Telegram to have a uh, more recent updates of the requirements. Okay, uh, move on to other questions from the attendees. Uh, they are also from uh, these attendees that actually asked about whether is there a need for a joint declaration between the developer and builder when they do these submissions or so maybe can uh, this uh, engineer uh, Long, can you actually address these questions? Is there a need for a joint declaration between developer and builder when they do a submission? Yeah. Um, okay, normally the builder has control of the site, the worker, so the builders actually have more insight of the activities. Uh, but the developer uh, should be involved in the sense that it is the development belongs to them. So we would require uh, the developer to sign on the form to acknowledge that they are aware uh, of what the builder is doing. Uh. So basically, it's, uh, the developer needs to sign on that form only. Yeah. I hope it's uh, a problem for you. my members. Like, I think it's a good practice. So at least you know what our computers are doing. Uh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Engineer Long. Uh, another question that has been asked is that uh, they asked about for uh, this construction of the uh, workers' temporary quarters, uh, for the cost that's been incurred for such construction, uh, which party should be uh, liable or responsible for such cost? Uh, is it the construction company or is it the owner of the property? Yeah. So for these questions, uh, can will Ted be able to answer this question? Yeah. Where's Ted? Hi, Ted. Hi, sorry, I, I didn't catch the full question. My, my hand's a bit okay. unstable. Okay, no no problem. So I'll repeat, uh, which party, is it the construction company or the, I mean, construction company meaning the contractors or the owner of the property, which is that the developer, uh, is liable or responsible for the cost incurred by the construction of the workers' temporary quarters? Okay, uh, this one, as of now, it will still fall under the contractors uh, or whoever is, is requiring to, to build the, the 
temporary quarters. I think previously we were looking at some form of uh, financial support, but uh, this uh, is still, we're still trying to push it through. So not to give any false hope or anything, but that is the current status. Uh, can I just yeah, add on a bit? Yeah, Mr. Chap. At the moment, it's under contract. But of course, at the end of the day, I think we all to make make sure that the project can continue. But of, I believe the SCARA has appealed to the minister or to the ministry to provide some help. Lah. So we really hope that the ministry can open to this and provide some more assistance lah, besides those announced last week lah, to alleviate these hardships lah, that the, many contractors are facing at the moment. Lah. And the future is quite uncertain for them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chia. Okay, another question uh, from one of them is that, uh, let's say, for example, if there's a PM entering the site, uh, the PM's name has already been submitted as one of the names in the list. However, another PM from the same company who wants to enter the same site, uh, will he be denied entry into the site? Uh, perhaps, uh, Vivian, can you actually uh, help to answer this question? Uh, yes. Uh, so, if they are then they will be classified as uh, visitors la. so they will not be denied entry but they will be actually taken as uh, visitors la. and let's say if the pm is entering site right, uh, within that two weeks uh, he would have to do his swap test done la. so he can still enter on that day itself if he's a sc or pr singapore citizen or pr so if he's a work permit holder or s pass holder then it's unlikely la. But if he's a Singaporean or PR, he can enter. And within that two weeks, right, he just need to get a swap test done. Or as a visitor also need to do a test, is it? Uh, yes. So actually, all if you look at the uh, FAQ, right, there's a table written down there. And it actually differentiates all the different types of uh, SE, PR, work permit, and who whether they're staying in dorm, not staying in dorm, when they need to do their periodic swap. Uh. So as long as you want to enter the work site, then they will have to do their swap. But because uh, just now the question was uh, a PM, uh, so he might only go, let's say, on a monthly basis or maybe only every two months. So the requirement is different. So if you only go every two months, once he enters that site, within that two weeks, he just needs to get one swap done. Yeah. Uh, Vivian, look here. Um, maybe the other alternative is to do uh, try to use technology to uh, do it remotely, like, if it's possible. Uh, that's yeah. one way. Yeah, so if he can visit it re the site remotely, right, that will even be better. Actually, that's what we encourage. Uh. Can I just uh, ask? Can we, yeah, maybe you take over, yeah. Sorry, can I just say, uh, ask one question? Uh, in the permit of approval, you require a three monthly schedule of work to be submitted. Uh, is this going to be permanent or is this going to be a temporary until uh, the everything issue is settled? Because for contractor to submit three month schedule, there's a lot, of, I mean, construction side is a construction side. There's a lot of changes, a lot of time they could respond to situation. Because this subcontractor may not turn out, the supply may, material may not be in time, you know, things like that. Uh, it's, it's not so simple. Uh, after I've seen so many projects under construction, I know there are difficulties. So I'm just trying to see what we can help the contractor to better manage the situation. Uh, yeah, okay, Vivian here, I'll take this question. Uh, regarding the three-month schedule, uh, it's more of a, it's actually a temporary thing. Uh. So uh, the purpose of the submission of the three-month schedule uh, is to ensure that the builder actually does the, like he does his planning for every three months in terms of activity, in terms of zoning. So actually moving forward, right, we're also looking at the option of removing this uh, requirement, but to amend it to say that uh, the builder must keep any modification of all this schedule at site. Uh, so that when our A and I team go down to check, right, as long as the builder is able to furnish that, oh, I have, because normally for builders, they will have all their uh, planning and their milestones. Uh, so as long as the builder is able to show that uh, over time, I have amended it. So the zoning, the segregation have amended to su as such, right, then that will be enough. Uh. 
So that's one of the modification that we are looking at. The main purpose is just to encourage builders to make sure that they have all this in place. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Mr. Ching, uh, for your questions. Uh, perhaps we can move on to those that raise hand. Uh, maybe we can take the first question from uh, Se Kiet Kwa. Yeah, Se Kiet Kwa, can you please unmute yourself yeah. to ask the I, question? Thank I'm, you. I'm Kwa Se Kiet from Wealthtech Construction, uh, the main con. Okay, uh, go, going through all these submissions, uh, uh, more or less the guidelines are quite uh, developed that we can follow. But there's one item I can never find an answer. I don't have a chance to to really get a clear answer on this is you see uh, just now mentioned about all this uh, like PM like I'm an AGM I may need to visit different sites I get the answer just now but in project we have this specialized uh, specialist contractor or short-term ad hoc uh, uh, works that they come in in a very short period of time and uh, or maybe for just hours from the guideline it say that uh, the rest of the those teams, right? We got the uh, that means individual work access way and so on and so forth for them to to, to move around and demarcated area for for this uh, ad hoc worker or the special this worker is said to we have to demarcate the area for them to work on. Okay, my question is very simple because understand that the virus will stay on on some surfaces for hours, but I cannot find any sanitary uh, I mean needs for any sanitary cleaning or even how long do we need to vacate the location that they left off after their work before the original team, permanent team have to take over back that portion to work. Can someone uh, at least give us a guideline on this or they move off from site straight away, they can occupy again and work on the same location because I understand the virus will float around and stay on surfaces alive for, for some time. So I can't find an answer for this. Thanks. Hi, thank you, Seket. Uh, maybe Vivian, would you be able to uh, take these questions on the side issues? Because it's about bubbling and the, or maybe engineer long can take over? I think uh long here. Uh, I think uh the FAQ there's some provision uh, or giving guidance on where on how the specialist uh contractor can uh, do the site activities. Lah. I think one of them is that uh they may need to be closely supervised by the SDO. Uh, that's that's uh that's how the criterion is, has been spec. But on your question on whether uh, once the workers have vacated the place for your uh, for your specialists to work on, whether how what is the buffer time that needs to be uh, maintained before the specialist team comes in, I don't think we have a guide guidance on that. Um, my my I mean my layman understanding is the the thing spreads by uh by air, you know, when you speak and all those things. So, I'm not sure whether that would be, uh, con uh, well, I'm not an expert in that, so maybe I stand guided. Lah. Maybe Vivian, you, can you add on this? Uh, yes, uh, okay. Uh, basically, in our worksite guidelines, right, if you look at section 23, under ensuring cleanliness, it's written down there that when, whenever there's a change in shift of workers, uh, so basically when your, when your specialist workers go in, right, they are taken as a separate shift of workers from the main workers. So there will be a need for clean down. And the clean down is actually written down there that the cleaning has to be carried out by a professional disinfection company. Uh. And there are actually guidelines in NEA. So we have written in that section and provided the link uh, for, to get to the NEA guidelines. So maybe you can, uh, your builder can refer to that as a guidelines on how to clean down and do the disinfection for each shift of workers. Uh. Okay, I stand guided section by Section 23, is it? Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Long. Thank you, Vivian. Okay, well, perhaps we will move on to one more question because it's about 12.05 now. Can we ask, uh, can we allow Cynthia Wong to uh, ask the last question? Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm, 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 um, I'm uh, working on an AEI project that involves tenancy work. So this tenancy work means there's several sub that is working within a confined space of a tenant unit, say about 100 meters square, that sort of thing. So uh, we noted on the issue about zoning and segregation. So I hear from the panel just now, just want to confirm that. So does it mean that um, we are allowed to have a few sub into that space of say 100 meters square, uh, provided we observe 
all the safe distancing requirement of uh, two meters away from uh, one another. All right, thank you. Uh, will Engineer Long or Vivian be able to advise on this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I look here, maybe just initially, I think for, for what you're talking about is a renovation works. Uh, so actually it's not a construction site per se. Uh, it's, uh, uh, therefore, there is no permit, no structural permit required from BCA. Is my understanding correct, Ms. Wong? Uh, no, uh, we're actually under a typical project uh, work site. It's an it's a AEI works that involves uh, general building work as well as a tenancy uh, unit work. Yeah. So we, we will have a problem if we can only allow one subcon to go in the tenant work at one time because like M&E work, there's already several trades involved. So we are saying that um, are we allowed to like, you know, I mean, within one meter, 100 meter square, you can easily get like 25 people within a while observing a two meter by two meter kind of spacing. So can we allow a few subcon within the same space to work at the same time? Otherwise, the productivity is really very much affected. Hmm. Uh, Vivian, do you, do you think you can answer this one? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, I think just now, actually, my colleagues have also mentioned that for short-term workers carried out by specialist contractors, right? So I would take this as uh, your tenancy works one as like specialist contractors. Uh, basically, because uh, they are normally only at site for like one to two days a week or uh, just temporary there until they finish their works. Uh. So what actually, we require, yeah. Actually, not really. They're, we're talking about a long-term. So they are full-time. Yes, like electrical, we have electrical aircon, we have uh, BMS workers. Uh, so are they cohorted together? Uh, yes, they will. Exactly. I mean, the point is we already cohort them into one location. They already oh, okay, okay. Them into teams. It's just that the nature of work is such that there's so many uh, interdependent activities. And uh, ah, okay. yeah, it's just not practical to have uh, one Time. Yeah, so it's uh, it's actually much easier because they are cohorted together already. So I can, can I take it that the different subcons are staying together in one place? Eh? Yes, yes. In fact, yeah, okay, then, teams. Yeah, then it won't be a problem. So if they are cohorted okay. together, basically the requirements is they'll be just taken as different teams. Eh? Yeah. Can I have one last question? Then the two meters thing will be correct. Like, yeah. Right, right. We will try to observe, of course, with the presence of SEO and SMO. Uh, one more point can I clarify about uh, site supervision? We also have a site team doing inspection work with the workers or testing and commission. So I also read somewhere along uh, FAQ that they are not supposed to mix, meaning my site team cannot mix with workers while doing supervision or inspection work. I think this is really quite impractical. But sometimes we need to communicate with workers what's wrong, what do we see and what needs to be rectified, especially comes to testing and commissioning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we understand that. Uh, but similar, like testing and commissioning, RI inspection, uh, these are what we classify as the high-risk workers. Uh, the meaning, uh, why we classify them as high-risk is because they normally go to multiple sites. Uh. So they actually carry, let's say if they are infected, right, they actually carry it to multiple sites. So which is why, right, in order to lower the risk of this, right, we are requiring them to be segregated away from the main group of workers. Uh. So this one is more of a no choice, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, site team actually belong to the project site itself. Like they don't actually travel. Yeah, RI probably is a different matter, but we're talking about site team that's dedicated for the project itself. Mm. So yeah. your TNC, when you say the workers, they are just... What kind of like... Okay, for example, they are... Yeah, for, for example, um, um, uh, electrical I... tests, you need to do... Uh, Sorry, sorry, Cynthia. Uh, Vivian, I think it's in interest of time. Uh, it's about 12.15, almost 12.15 already. So maybe uh, we can take the questions uh, from your type written and yeah, we'll come sure. back to you yeah. on this. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, maybe just to add on one more point about the tenancy, we understand it's about renovations and all those things. So we are also organizing a session tomorrow for renovation works. So if you're interested to also attend, uh, you can also sign up for the, uh, this webinar. Yeah, which is targeting at renovators, which is tomorrow afternoon, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, so with that, uh, we have come to the end of the webinar clinic. Uh, we'll collect all the questions posted and FAQs will be uploaded on PCA's website at a later date. Uh, before I end, maybe uh, Mr. Chia, would you like to end off with uh, any, any, any uh, remarks? Yeah. I want to thank everybody from BCA for helping uh, to organize this uh, Clinic. I think it's very useful. I think from the number of questions you have, about 115, 116 still running, 
and it shows that the, my and the members and the builders are quite anxious. La. So perhaps we can have uh, another session uh, soon to, to more or less allow more people to uh, surface their problems or for some help. So uh, importantly is to more answer the questions now and then the send to them under the Q&A so that they can get what they are seeking for, the answer to what they are seeking for. So thank you again for this uh, seminar and uh, I hope that uh, you will consider our request to have a second one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chia. Uh, how, Mr. Ching, do you have anything to add on? Uh, no, I think uh, I must appreciate uh, BCA done a lot of work for the industry as SAP. Uh, still one key work, the coordination among the various agencies is a key to the success because everybody has different requirements, then contractor don't know what to do. I think, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chia. Thank you, Mr. Ching. Uh, with you. that, I would like to thank the webinar chairperson, speakers for the valuable, in, valuable insights about the good practices on project restart application. It has been a very fruitful session. Also, mm -hmm. we are so pleased to share that this is now on Telegram and would like to strongly encourage attendees to subscribe to it to find out about the latest, latest updates and information on the B sector. For your ease of subscribing, we have prepared a QR code on the screen for your scanning. So I hope that you all can sign up to the Telegram uh, right now. So on this note, we'll come to the end of these sessions. You'll be able to download the speaker's presentation materials on the BCA website. On behalf of Radars and BCA, we would like to thank you for your participation in making this clinic a success. We wish you a safe and smooth restart. Uh, signing off, Kenway from BCA. Thank you. <laughs>